And good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, I am um, Lynn Goldman, and I am the Michael and Laurie Milken Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to our 12th annual Southie Lecture in Comparative Health Policy. As the Dean of George Washington School of Public Health, I'm proud of all the opportunities we provide our students, alumni, friends, and community members to hear and learn from leaders and experts from so many public health disciplines. This is especially true when it comes to the annual South Bee Lecture. Today, you will hear from our very own David Michaels. Dr. David Michaels is Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health, an author, and former and longest serving OSHA Administrator. Before we introduce David, I would like to introduce my friends and two of our school's dearest supporters, Drs. Richard and Janet Southby. For the past, past four decades, the Southbys have been leaders here at GW, and for many more years than that, they have been pioneers in the field of public health. Richard came to GW in 1979 as the chair of the Department of Health Services Management and Policy. He was a leader in establishing the School of Public Health and our Department of Health Policy. I am grateful that he continues his service to GW as a member of my Dean's Advisory Council. I greatly appreciate his advice and counsel and have learned a great deal from him over the years. Thank you for that, Richard. I equally value and I'm grateful for Janet's leadership. Janet served in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps for 31 years as a Colonel and Chief at the Department of Nursing at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. She also served as the very first female senior medical social aide at the White House. Given her commitment to the field of nursing and our university, she serves as a member of the GW School of Nursing Dean's Advisory Council. Richard and Janet's generosity has made this annual lectureship possible. Thank you both for your commitment to enriching our community and the greater health policy dialogue. At this time, I would like to invite Richard to make welcoming remarks on behalf of Janet and himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Goldman. And uh, welcome and good afternoon to uh, our audience for the uh, 2021 lecture in our series. In establishing this lectureship, uh, Janet and I hoped that it would be a forum for bringing uh, distinguished faculty, public health and health policy professionals and health practitioners to the school to discuss current health policy issues with an emphasis when appropriate on a comparative uh, basis. Last year, like many other activities, we canceled the 2020 lecture with David uh, Michaels due to COVID-19. And Janet and I are delighted that David agreed to give his lecture this year uh, even if it's virtually. We hope that next year we'll be able to hold the 2022 lecture in person on the university campus. We want to thank Dean Goldman for her strong support of this lecture series and also Mr. Patrick Sanders, Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations in the Milken Institute School of Public Health for his outstanding work in making all the arrangements and communications uh, to make this lecture possible today. So thank you, uh, Patrick. We're looking forward to Dr. Michael's lecture this afternoon and the following discussion. And I'll now hand back to Dean Goldman uh, for her introduction of Dr. Michael's. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I am so grateful to you and Janet for your commitment to our school and the university more broadly. I look forward to return to having this lecture in person. It'll be great to be able to gather once again in the South Bay Conference Room in our school. But it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Michaels. Dr. Michaels is somebody who I've known uh, personally and professionally for a very long time. If I say when that relationship started, then I reveal too much about our age. But suffice it to say that when I worked for the state of California, I met him in the context of appointing him to an expert advisory committee on which actually he um, displayed enormous talent. And he has continued to do so year after year after year in the various roles in which he served. He is an accomplished epidemiologist and a professor in our environmental and occupational health department here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. His books, The Triumph of Doubt, Dark Money and the Science of Deception, 
um, um, the most recent one, they, they are must read books. Um, these are eye opening, um, really exposés of the role of science for hire in American life, um, an issue that I think David and I both have experienced firsthand in roles that we served um, in the government. And one that I think is very important to bring forward in a way that David brings it forward so that the public can understand uh, what's going on. Um, notably, <laughs> David served in President Obama's administration as Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health, as well as having the honor of being the longest serving administrator in OSHA's history as he served for an Assistant Secretary of Labor under President um, uh, Obama. Um, prior to that, he also served in President Clinton's administration in the Department of Energy, also as an assistant secretary. He is a tremendous thought leader and a public health advocate. I am tremendously proud to have him as a member of our faculty here at the School of Public Health. So David, thank you for being today's speaker. I look forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Goldman and uh, Dean Southby. It's a great honor to be here giving a lecture in, in your name. Um, because you've played such an important role in launching the School of Public Health. Uh, it's great to see all my friends and colleagues here as well. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Um, there. Is that? I can never really tell if it's on. Um, it isn't yet. Uh, yeah, we, I... Okay, so let me do the share screen here. And okay. So yeah, we should be seeing great. Terrific. Well, thank you. Um, I'll just dive right in. Uh, you know, this is an interesting moment in the country's history. We're having, among other discussions, a discussion of the meaning of the word infrastructure. Uh, President Biden's American Jobs Plan includes not just roads and bridges, but also clean water, broadband, and home care for the elderly and disabled. You know, public health infrastructure, which we often talk about in, in the school, is also equally broad, involving both concrete things and interactions and programs and, and policy. Um, it involves public health and environmental agencies on local, state, and national levels. Uh, it could work directly with individuals or with corporations offering vaccinations or conducting restaurant or workplace inspections or issuing guidance or regulations aiming to prevent illness or injury. Of course, surveillance and data collection is a big part of it. Uh, let me show you this. This is a recent slide that the Beaumont Foundation sort of reconsidered, you know, what is this public health system? Um, and they've come to the conclusion after a long process, of really there are 10 essential public health services, all focused around obviously improving public health, but also focus on equity, which is such an important issue. Um, and what I'll be talking about here are the, sort of the, um, some of the services at the bottom of the chart here on um, policies, plans, and laws, regulatory actions. Uh, they have a, a huge impact on people's lives. Now, the public health system, you could think of it just as part of our healthcare system, but it's, all, it's important to note the great disparity in funding that we spend more per capita on medical care than any other country in the world. Um, when all this healthcare spending is aggregated, public health is less than 3% of the total. Or at least that's what it was before COVID, uh, probably has gone up uh, since then. And so I'm gonna focus just on uh, this, sort of this, this regulatory component at the very bottom here. Uh, now, I think everybody who's been involved in the world of public health knows about the great successes of public health, many because of laws and regulations, uh, rather than uh, because of the, of the medical care system. Um, tuberculosis death rates, for example, were dropping long before uh, we had any sort of medical intervention, any sort of pharmaceutical invention with what we call sometimes disparagingly in the COVID world, not I don't call them disparagingly, but some do, non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, essentially helped us eliminate most of tuberculosis long before we had any way to, to treat it. Um, we are making great progress on reducing 
the chronic diseases caused by air pollution because of our system, our regulatory system, which says that uh, air pollutants, water pollutants, et cetera, have to be limited. Um, and we're doing a great job and everything, you know, the exposures are going down. You know, the, the laws that required taking lead out of gasoline and cleaning up lead-based paint has led to a significant increase in intelligence in children growing up today compared to say children, uh, you know, who grew up of my age. I mean, it's reasonable to think that kids today are several IQ points smarter than we are, or we were, uh, because of these laws. Um, workplace injuries. Um, 50 years ago, there were about 37 deaths every day in the American workplace, 37 deaths. Now we're now at 14 deaths a day with a workforce twice as large. It, it's not great, too many, but we've made great progress. A lot of this system though, public health is, is invisible to most people. And of course, you don't count things that don't occur. And so when lead, when lead poisoning is less, we don't notice it. Um, and, but we take for granted that we have this system that, that actually functions pretty well. In many parts of the world, waterborne diseases are highly prevalent, affecting a, a sizable portion of the population. We have this amazing system that delivers clean water to our home. We just have to turn a little no knob and clean water comes out and it takes away the human waste that we produce. And we only talk about when it flagrantly fails, like it did recently in Flint, Michigan, also because of policy changes that were ill-considered, or more recently in, in Texas and Mississippi, when again, because of a lack of, of investment and other decisions, that system essentially stopped working. At that point, it becomes a, a, a crisis. Um, now, the events of the last few years, and this is also pre-COVID, have really um, illuminated how the public health system works. And uh, in some ways, it hasn't been a, a very positive message. Uh, first, um, you know, the, the Trump administration undermined many of the really important agencies and activities of public health and environmental health. Um, we don't need to go into detail. The damage done to the EPA and OSHA are very well known and well documented. And it'll take a long time to recover. And that was before COVID. With COVID, we had a White House leadership who cared much more about making President Trump happy than saving thousands of lives. And so our response was a disaster on so many levels. And you know, we've, we've paid the price, hundreds of thousands of deaths that could have been prevented. I mean, it is absolute tragedy. Um, so we started off very badly with, at best, best mixed messages from the White House. There was an unwillingness to recognize the extent of the problem, to put mitigation measures or these non-pharmaceutical interventions into effect. Um, eventually, CDC documents were edited, or maybe a better word for this is, is vandalized to fit the White House's political needs. And while it is dramatically improving under new leadership. Much of the theory of change underlying the government and the public health community um, during the Trump administration are still constructed on the decisions that were made by the Trump administration was essentially focus on voluntary individual actions. Um, the CDC, the World Health Organization, others, um, other public health organizations are telling us wear a mask, keep distance, wash your hands, you know, stay home and now, of course, most importantly, get vaccinated. And these are all vital, of course, but they have their limitations. They all depend on individuals' actions. But public health is about community. It's about all of us together and taking steps to protect everyone, including people who can't so easily take those steps themselves. Now, the federal government is now using some of the authority that, that President Trump refused to use, the CDC, for example, now requires masks on interstate and global travel originating or ending in the United States. Uh, remarkably, that had been blocked by the Trump White House, even though the airlines, for example, were begging for that. They said, please let us require masks. And that was not allowed, but now, now that is. Um, but the public health lessons of the last century, going back to those, um, the tuberculosis wars, um, 
and the founding of the EPA after you know, tremendous environmental problems and the burning of the Cuyahoga River, the public health focus in many ways has been forgotten. Responsibilities are shifted to the individual who, uh, who are not, and individuals aren't equally able to gain that protection. Um, I think it's best exemplified with the CDC guidance about people who are vaccinated no longer need to be masked or concerned about distance. This is uh, the new CDC guidance. So in indoor settings with potential for significant exposure, CDC is now saying that people who are vaccinated, unvaccinated should be masked. And if you're vaccinated, you don't really have to. Of course, the impact of that decision was immediate by saying we're gonna divide people up, we're gonna make them different. Mask mandates have been dropped in many states. And it's a, a very worrisome development right now when especially we've got this new variant, Delta is, is uh, getting much more prevalent in the United States. It's, we could see in England, it's already, it's, it's led to England delaying a reopening. Um, but we've seen this all around the country. So, and not surprisingly, as the Washington Post reported yesterday, um, infections are rising in states where vaccination rates are low. And that's even though there, is vac there are vaccinations in those places, but with the dropping of these public health precautions, rates are going up. Now, you may be aware that last week, OSHA, the agency I ran during the Obama administration, issued finally an emergency temporary standard to protect healthcare workers from COVID-19, but elected not to issue a standard for workers in meat and poultry and agriculture, retail, and other high-risk settings. Um, needless to say, that was deeply disappointing. Um, and I fear that the virus, virus transmission will accelerate uh, because a large portion of working class adults are not vaccinated. Um, but that's for, I think this is for a, another discussion, another day's um, lecture. But let's talk about COVID for a minute because what COVID's done is exposed major gaps and weaknesses in our public health system. Oh, hold on, um, no, let's, we'll wait on that for a minute. Um, the vaccination distribution system is suboptimal, some suboptimal uh, with inadequate efforts to actively reach out to populations who should have been prior, prioritized for vaccination. Um, it's become very clear we do not have any sort of national data system to collect public health information that would have helped us track cases. We simply don't know enough about the effect of the pandemic on subpopulations by race, by um, ethnicity, industry, occupation. Uh, we do a pretty mediocre job tracking the growth of variants. And if we had a better data system collecting more, about, more data about people and viruses, we'd be much better off understanding new waves and we'd be able to prevent the new infections much more easily. And we see this all now, um, but before COVID, BC, um, during the Trump administration and before, we could see the weaknesses of these same agencies. We watched the further deterioration of the agencies um, during Trump, but uh, I'll make the case that we always had great weaknesses. So the, uh, it's easy now to have a response that says, okay, we need to rebuild these agencies. Let's give them big budgets and give them the ability to hire a lot more people. You know, that's an easy solution. Stop the hemorrhaging of people, pump money in, et cetera. What I contend, and this is the hypothesis of this lecture, is that would be a big mistake. Before Trump, I think the system was inadequate. It had severe gaps and inadequacies that were getting bigger and bigger with changes in technology and social factors. And COVID illuminated that, but this was certainly the case before. So let, let me give you a few pieces of examples of that. And of course, I go back to the agency I know the most about, but I'll discuss several of them. You know, OSHA is just 50 years old. Um, December 1970, President Nixon signed the OSHA law uh, with a little bit of hyperbole, but not that much, saying it was the most important piece of legislation for those 55 million workers, uh, perhaps ever passed by Congress. And that's because before the OSHA law, workers did not have the right to a safe workplace. If you're facing hazards, even life threatening ones, there was nothing you could do about it. You could do, the, do that or you could quit or get fired. Um, that changed with OSHA. 
it hasn't changed enough, but certainly did change. And OSHA opened its doors 50 years ago in April. There wasn't, given COVID and the change administration, there wasn't much national notice of it, but it certainly happened. But that was 50 years ago. We're now in a very different world in terms of work. You know, you go into a workplace now, uh, most of the workers may not be working for the company whose name is on the door. You have independent contractors. You've got a huge industry of temporary workers who are, go to different workplaces all the time. Um, you've got uh, gig workers where uh, their employer, essentially the, the platforms claim not to be an employer at all. None of these workers, most of these workers are not really covered by OSHA. Um, hang on, I have to... Um, So things need to be changed in OSHA. And I've, I've been writing about this for a while, and there's a paper I did in the American Journal of Public Health with Jordan Barab. Um, let me show you some problems of where we are. You know, I, I showed you that chart earlier that showed how mortality, workplace injuries have really gone down significantly. And that's true for the first 20 years of OSHA. But now we're at a point where they're not going down. In fact, they're sort of going up. The fatal work injury rate and the number are, are flat. We're not doing any better. So what about OSHA's tools? And I think this is really the problem. They're, they're no longer very effective. And I'm not sure they were that effective at the beginning, but the problem was so great, they were effective then. Um, you know, OSHA famously conducts inspections, but because of the, it's the size of the OSHA inspectorate, it's got enough inspectors to visit every workplace once every 160 years. So that that's not a very big, uh, it doesn't, get a, a lot, a high proportion of, of workplaces. So one of OSHA's um, tools is to say, well, if we issue a big fine, that will send a lesson and it'll tell other employers, you don't want to risk that fine, so you better uh, get rid of your hazards. That's, we call that deterrence. But the maximum fine right now for a serious violation is fifteen less than $15,000. Now, OSHA can play with that. There are ways to make it higher, but uh, one thing we saw, for example, was uh, during the begin, the early parts of the COVID pandemic, we had meat cutting plant, meat packing plants where hundreds of workers were infected and dozens of workers were hospitalized. And OSHA went into several of them. One, one famous one, the um, Smithfield uh, Foods one in, in South Dakota, where over a thousand workers were infected, and the fine was less than fifteen thousand dollars. So every time you issue a fine, it sends a message. A large fine tells other employers. Um, you need to essentially clean up your workplace before you get a big fine. A small fine says you don't have to worry about it. And that's the message that OSHA was putting out for a number of years. But even when I ran OSHA, we tried to maximize the fines. They still were very small. There's a headline I, uh, from a magazine when OSHA, the maximum fine at the time was $7,000. And they, we found some seri a serious problem at an Amazon warehouse. We find Amazon $7,000. And the headline said, OSHA fines... Amazon, virtually nothing. Now OSHA's most powerful tool is a standard because it's, it's a law. It says, this is what you have to do in your workplace. We don't need to inspect. It says you have to do that. And most employers want to be law abiding and they have attorneys, they have HR departments, they follow um, OSHA standards. And if OSHA issues a standard, it has a wholesale effect. Well, on average, it, it takes OSHA more than 10 years to issue a standard for a single chemical um, because the, the number of analyses required uh, to do that are huge. So here being an example, um, when OSHA first came out, they issued a standard for vinyl chloride, uh, protect, which was found to be a very powerful liver carcinogen. Uh, the standard was 10 pages. Uh, we issued a, a standard that OSHA had been working on for 20 years, the silica standard, and that was 600 federal register pages, which is 1,800 manuscript pages. And then there was more. There were more materials that we had to post on the web that weren't even in that. So to do that work is, makes no sense at all. But that's what it takes to issue a standard for a single chemical. So as a result, uh, we, very few new new standards for chemicals. OSHA has no standard for airborne infectious pathogens like COVID-19, and they, they, we were working on one. We started after H1N1, and we were five or six years into it when the Trump administration took over and work stopped on that. 
Um, but the other thing that's really important, and this isn't just for OSHA, but for all these other agencies, is the requirement to protect people, I often call the body in the morgue method. And that says you can't regulate the chemical until you have good evidence that's causing harm. And in that case, by the time you get to regulating it, you've already got quite a few people who've been sick because you can, you can identify that. And then you've got people who will get sick because they've already been exposed. It's very difficult to look at these as um, essentially uh, saying this looks like it could be hazardous, but because if you did that based on the current law, you'd, go to be, you'd be in court immediately and you'd be told, well, you can't regulate that because you haven't shown that it's harmful. Um, I call this basic, I, th this, this basic um, theory, you know, presumed innocence. And this is actually used by corporations and scientists who defend them, product defense scientists, essentially uh, applying this idea saying, uh, you have to show a chemical is danger is hazardous, just like you have to show that, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that a person is guilty of a crime before they can be punished for it. So the idea that a person is presumed innocent until found guilty is applied to chemicals, which is totally, um, you know, it's a, it's a, bad, it's a terrible idea. Um, and it's really not appropriate because what you want to do is, is you've got to prioritize, you've got to privilege public health and say, if there's a question about this being dangerous, we just shouldn't let it on the market. Now, there's some new EPA laws, which hopefully will help us get there. But most agencies are still based on this body in the morgue presumed innocent model. Um, and that's, that will hold us back from taking on chemicals. The other big area I think that we have to think about, which is very much related to this, is we have classes of chemicals that we don't understand what every member of that class does, but we understand enough. The, um, the ones that are in the news all the time are these uh, perfluorinated substances, PFAS chemicals or forever chemicals um, used in, in Scotchgard or Gore-Tex or Teflon. We actually have terrific epidemiologic data, very powerful data on two of those chemicals, the ones that were used in Teflon because there, was, there were lawsuits against DuPont and uh, very well-known epidemiologists were brought in uh, through an agreement by DuPont and the communities suing them. And they did several studies. They showed that these, these two perfluorinated chemicals cause all sorts of human damage. And there's not really a lot of debate on that because these are the best studies we're going to get about you know, chemicals in water that have caused damage. So we could theoretically, and actually EPA is moving to regulate those two chemicals, but there are 6,000, actually more than 6,000 chemicals in this class of, uh, this larger class of chemicals. 6,000 members of, of PFAS. We have data on two. Are we going to wait until we get bodies in the morgue for the other, for five or 10 or 20 more before we regulate them? And we'll never get to the end. It's, we, we used to call this regulatory whack-a-mole. You could um, go after one chemical, but you then get substitution for something else that could, could even be worse. And of course, you've got regulatory capture. And this has always been a concern. And this is true in Democrat or Republican administrations. Um, the regulatory agencies are sometimes too close to the, to the companies they regulate. Um, and they make decisions that aren't necessarily in the best interest of the public. Uh, just, I believe, last week, uh, FDA approved the uh, licensing of a uh, Alzheimer's drug, which their own advisory committee almost unanimously said, please do not approve this drug because it just doesn't work. And will cost tens, there, it'll be tens of thousands of dollars a year for anybody who takes this drug. And it will mean billions of dollars of profits for Biogen, but there's no indication that it will lead to any in improvement in the, the tragedy facing people with, with Alzheimer's disease and will cost those families, the insurance industry and taxpayers billions of dollars. Um, with regulatory capture comes sort of the decay of these agencies and they often don't have the, um, the technical expertise to be able to keep up with uh, the safety and health regulations, they, they, the safety and the oversight they need to uh, accomplish. And the, the best, again, a tragic example of that 
is the Boeing 737 MAX jet. Essentially, F, the, um, the FAA, which is never well-funded, even though it could be, it, part of it's funded actually by, by um, uh, sur surcharge on tickets. The, the FAA didn't have the, the people or the expertise to oversee the, the safety in the design of the 737 MAX. They outsourced it to Boeing, which assured them, don't worry, we're on top of this. And after the first uh, jet went down, FAA still didn't do anything. And they, they, they trusted Boeing. And eventually a second jet went down, killed 346 people, um, finally resulting in uh, grounding of this entire fleet, setting air travel back. Um, it certainly cost Boeing and all the airlines a tremendous amount of money. Um, needlessly, if, if FAA had been well-funded and could do that itself, we could have avoided this problem. And finally, across the board, there are equity issues. Um, one of the ones that really has gotten some very important attention because it, that we've got a, a huge problem um, is environmental justice and the, the um, increased exposures that occur in communities of color. Um, for the last more than 20 years, the EPA has had an um, Office of, Economic, uh, of Environmental Justice. There's very little evidence that it was effective at all. Um, there was no slowing down, lo locating uh, toxic dumps and other things in, in poor communities. Um, you know, there, it, no shortage of, of public awareness of it, but the pressure to stop that was never there because these communities often don't have a lot of say, they don't have a lot of political power. Um, and we could see this in um, higher rates of chronic disease in these communities as well. There's no question there's a relationship. Um, one part of the environment, uh, which we, I think we have to talk about environmental justice is the work environment. And this has gotten a little less public attention though I think it's of great importance. I'd be happy if anyone on this uh, Zoom lecture wants to pursue it further, I'd love to hear from you. Um, the work environment where many people, many adults spend you know, close to half or 40% or of their waking hours is one also where uh, workers of color are at much greater risk. Here's just, we don't have, again, good studies on this, but one study that looked at the prevalence of work-related disability um, by uh, race ethnicity, you could see that the overwhelming, that at the overwhelming effect of work, um, as uh, workers of color get older, they're more likely to be injured and disabled and, and they can't work or they have to work for less money. Um, and certainly their risk is far higher than the risk of white workers. Not, it's not surprising, of course, to find that um, workers in um, the worst jobs, the lowest, so often the lowest paying jobs, but certainly the most hazardous jobs often are workers of color. Um, there's been a lot of focus on, on meatpacking workers, workers in meat, um, because COVID is such a terrible, has taken such a terrible toll on them. But those jobs were terrible before COVID. And those are jobs that are overwhelmingly people of color and immigrants. At one time, these were high paying jobs. There was a very strong union and the jobs were among the highest paid union jobs, manufacturing jobs in the country. Those unions were broken. And um, right now, as and the industry became much stronger, it's a place where immigrants, it's often the first job of immigrants. The State Department often will help immigrants settle in these communities because they're willing to take these jobs. And if you go to the South Dakota uh, Smithfield uh, Foods Plant, for example, there are many dozens of languages spoken on the, on the uh, shop floor because it's the first job that people get when they become refugees, they're refugees coming to the United States. And these are people, they take these jobs, they're willing to work very hard for not enough pay and they don't complain. And the company is like that. And that was before COVID. And now we know what happens to them in COVID. They've certainly paid the price with, with hundreds of deaths. And of course, we found that, that black and Latin work, Latino workers were overrepresented in many of the so-called essential uh, jobs, the essential industries that we need to keep functioning. We need people to work in those jobs to keep society functioning when people like us um, could stay home and, and do their work by Zoom. Um, 
but the people that go in every day and risk their lives, literally, uh, tended to be much more people of color. And of course, they're underpaid jobs as well. If you look at essential workers, we're far more likely to report SNAP, that's the food stamp uh, benefits, than non-essential counterparts. So these are hard jobs, they're risky jobs, and they're, they're low paid jobs as well. And of course, we see then the impact of this because of COVID. And while COVID was seen at the beginning as, well, it's a disease of, of older, uh, older people, it, it swept through nursing homes. Um, there was a huge race, race gap in who was dying from COVID. And that continues today. Um, it's not seen as easily in the overall numbers and the CDC collects very little or not enough information on race, but from places where the, the data are collected, you could see that um, at the younger age groups, in other words, working age people, the likelihood uh, that the person who died from COVID was black or Latin was overwhelming. It was only once you got up to the uh, older, really much older age groups, did you see that um, there was less of a, a gap between white and black and Latino uh, people who died from COVID. And of course, we're seeing that now in the in distribution of vaccination. Um, this is a, from the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation, projecting um, by the early July deadline set by President Biden, what proportion of the population will be have at least one uh, vaccine dose? And as you can see, um, it's projected by then 66% of the white population uh, will have one dose compared to about 50%, 51% of the black population. Um, and that's not primarily because of, you know, people become anti-vaxxers. There's some skepticism, but there really hasn't been good outreach to those communities. And part of it, you could see this, it's not purely a race issue. It's a combination of race and class. If you look at college graduates, um, now this has done a survey because we don't have good data, actual data, but a survey, um, black college graduates are more likely to have been vaccinated than white college graduates. But if you get to non-graduates, in other words, working class people, that's sort of our surrogate for working class, you could see um, whites are 51% vaccinated compared to 43% black and 45% Hispanic. And so reaching out to these working communities is going to be very important to address this. So the, the final issue around sort of the limitations of, of our system that I want to address, our, our public health regulatory system, is this question of science. Um, that the science underlying, underpinning our public health system is under attack. It has been under attack for a long time, but it's under attack more effectively now. And, you know, look, we can go back to tobacco and everybody knows that, you know, the tobacco playbook has gotten, um, you know, it's become a sort of accepted truth because it, it's very real. Um, the tobacco industry figured out that um, they, if they could manufacture uncertainty about this question, does uh, cigarette smokers, do cigarette smokers get lung cancer because they smoke cigarettes? If we can question that, if we could raise enough questions about it, if we can create doubt, we don't have to do what really needs to be done, which is stop selling cigarettes. Um, if there's a policy you don't like, that's, that's, the, that's what you need to do. Of course, that same strategy was used then by um, the fossil fuel industry that funded scientific science consulting firms and, and some of these Washington think techs. This was a, um, a, a little book um, that was actually sent to every high school science teacher in the country paid for by the fossil fuel industry, saying scientists disagree about global warming. Of course, because with our sort of simple caricature of science, if scientists don't agree, then we just have to do more research and we don't really have to do anything to stop the problem until we figure it out. Um, and so I've written about this. Uh, Dr. Goldman um, mentioned my book, the, my most recent book, Triumph of Doubt, Dark Money and the Science of Deception. So this is the plug for my book. Um, and what I see, and this certainly was the case before COVID, but during Trump, it really became a, a more significant problem. Uh, it really has become standard operating procedure 
for corporations that want to that are facing regulation or litigation. People are saying this could be making people sick, could be victims who are, who are suing, um, to manufacture uncertainty, to, to apply the tobacco playbook um, around the harms their, their products could be causing. And a lot of that is done now by scientists where it's no longer the public relations firms, but there are scientific firms that are available. And that's, that's their business model to do this, to create this sort of uncertainty. I call this the Enronization of science. Um, many of you will remember Enron, which was a um, company that prete it pretended to be a business that, that bought and sold energy futures and energy um, at, the, at the moment. But um, it was really a house of cards and a couple of people made a huge amount of money on that. And when it collapsed, a lot of people lost their pensions and people lost their jobs. Um, and because there really was nothing there. It's, it's very similar in some ways. Um, scientists are hired to defend products or activities in this regulatory arena or the legal arena. Um, they're not hired to provide valid science to say what's really going on here. Their value is to uh, influence regulation or to win lawsuits. Um, and the science they produce is, I think questionable is probably generous. Um, so I want to give you an example. Um, this was a, there's one firm, the Weinberg Group, um, used to, they're doing a little less of this these days, but they actually put this case study, which is part of their public relations, I guess, on the web um, until I wrote about it and they pulled it down. But it gives you a sense of how this group works. So keep in mind here, the Food and Drug Administration, generally, once it, it um, approves a drug, it will not pull it off the market except for two conditions. One is if it simply doesn't work, it'll pull it from the market, or if the harms greatly outweigh the benefits. And with drugs, that's that's really quite a, a leap because every drug, because it's biologically active, probably does cause, have, cause some adverse effects. And that, that comes with the territory, but it's worth it if you're treating a, a illness that the side effects or the adverse effects are, are acceptable. But if they're really terrible, it'll pull, and there are other drugs that work, they, they might pull it off the market. So here's an example here where the Weinberg Group was brought in because the FDA proposed cancellation of a registered new drug. Uh, and of course, there's a, a administrative process to do that. It's a legal process. So the Weinberg Group was retained by two manufacturers of the drug under attack. So the FDA is attacking the drug in this construct here. The Weinberg Group was retained to define strategy for the hearing, identify experts to be used in the continued support of the drug, assist in the preparation of experts for written testimony, in other words, ghostwriting their testimony, assist um, analysis of the testimony of the experts for the FDA, that's sort of cross-examining them, preparation for oral cross-examine and preparation of summary brief. This led to an extensive process with a written appeal from the first decision to the commissioner leading to 10 additional years of sales prior to the ultimate cancellation. So FDA eventually was able to get this drug off the market, but we, we had 10 more years where it, it was allowed to be sold. And so that's, that's exactly the, the problem we're, we're facing here. Um, I think this has a big impact on science. I think this, we saw this in, in COVID also, this, this sort of dueling scientists ideas, the idea that you can't trust scientists. I think it, it has an effect on how people look at science. They look at, rather than um, look at scientists as uh, people who are really trying to help understand the world better so we can make a better world. They look at them as mercenaries and sort of dueling scientists. And I think that's that's very unfortunate. We, and um, I think that encourages people not to do the things that we think uh, would, it'd be better for them to do. Now, I, I think we're, we're hoping to begin to address this now. Um, the public health crises facing the country right now are enormous. I mean, beyond COVID, you know, we've got climate change with the severe weather events. Um, we've got a, a, another devastating epidemic, opioid overdoses, which are, is uh, raging. It's worse than it was years ago. Um, we're worried about new infectious disease pandemics. There's no shortage of crises out there. Um, so now is the time to restore the regulatory component of the public health infrastructure. But uh, to steal a, a phrase, I think we have to build back better. 
we can't just go back to where we were before because that wasn't working. Um, and I think there's some hope. On, on his first day in office, President Biden signed this uh, executive order, this, actually this is officially a memo, not an executive order, saying um, we have to rethink how we're doing regulation. It can't just be uh, what we used to see all the time coming out of uh, the White House when they reviewed the agency's regulatory uh, efforts. Costs and benefits usually focus on reducing costs as much as they could. Um, uh, what this um, memo says is that the regulatory review process can promote public health and safety, and it can promote economic growth and social welfare and racial justice, environmental stewardship, human dignity, equity, and the interests of future generations. This is a remarkable turn of phrases for a White House memo around regulations. Um, and this is a national discussion that I think all of us in the public health community need to participate in and participate in enthusiastically. Um, we, have to, we have to defend regulation uh, and defend the importance of regula the regulatory system in capitalism. You know, the free market can't function without regulation. The rhetoric that we hear from the Heritage Foundation, uh, from the Koch brothers, that I heard daily when I was running OSHA, is this idea that regulations kill jobs. In fact, sometimes you didn't hear it, the phrase regulation, you'd only hear, hear the phrase job killing regulation. But in fact, regulation, uh, well, those, that, um, thinking that that rhetoric isn't really anti-regulatory. It's just opposed to regulations that the patrons don't like. They live on regulation. Um, the attacks on efforts to control greenhouse gases come from, you know, fuel, fossil fuel corporations and organizations and so-called experts that they support. But in fact, those industries wouldn't exist but for government regulation. Um, let me explain. The, the regulations have long history, well, let's pass on that one. Um, going, thinking about the market it goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, and the basis of markets and capitalism is regulation. Um, the basis of individual liberty is laws and regulations through which the government protects each person from the harms by actions of others. And you know this is often forgotten and maybe advocates of the free market don't like to acknowledge this dynamic, but this is the underpinning of our economic system. Um, regulations define market structure and property rights while attempting to ensure that property rights don't intrude on personal liberties. If a product is advertised a certain weight, you know, we have lo long standing laws that say it must actually be that weight. People, in society, in the market, can't steal from each other, right? That's private property. Without the regulatory apparatus of the state, our economy could not exist. The state fosters a safe space for market growth. And our current regulatory system is an extension of those rules to the more complex workings of the modern economy. The objectives of laws and agencies that you know we write about, that we work in, um, the objectives of these agencies is to stop damage and prevent future harm. It's to make sure that the actors in our market respect each other and don't hurt each other. And that maintains the free market system. It can, if people are being hurt by the actions of people in the market, it has to stop. Um, now, much of our regulatory system is actually the response to specific market disasters. You know, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle led directly to the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, Drugs Act, although, you know, was it, Famously, it was a disappointment to Upton Sinclair, who had focused his book on the deplorable working conditions in the slaughterhouses. And you know, he, he said, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. But he hit it hard enough that we actually passed laws saying food can't be adulterated in the way he described. Most of our important environmental laws followed, you know, the disasters, the the, the terrible era of the 1960s, or Love Canal, or the mine safety laws that, that, that followed some of the really terrible mine disasters with dozens of workers killed. 
So we all value freedom, particularly the freedom to live the lives we choose. But this isn't possible unless we secure, we're secure from being harmed by others. And in this modern world, individuals, we can't bargain with a factory owner or the manufacturer of contaminated food or pesticide. We have little knowledge of the effects of a given exposure individually. And sometimes we can't even know if we're being exposed. It's up to our elected officials um, and appointed officials who have to enact and enforce laws that protect us from individual and collective harm, from violence and from robbery, but also from the dangers po posed by tainted food or polluted air and water or unsafe or ineffective drugs or dangerous workplace exposures. exposures. So science underpins all public health and environmental regulations. The basic principle of the regulatory system holds that decisions must be made on the basis of the best evidence available at the time, the best evidence available now. We want stronger regulation, not because we don't care about freedom, but because we can't be free without the state's protection from harm. We need to know that our air is safe to breathe, that our food is safe to eat, and that we can return home from work at the end of our shifts, no less healthy than when we walked out the door in the morning. That is both the imperative and that's our challenge. So my final thought on this, first, given what we've been through, the Trump administration, the COVID, now is the time to be bold. We can't settle for, for tweaks around the, the side. We need to say, how do we make this work for everybody in a way that really is fair and effective? And we can't do it alone. This is a time where we in the public health community have to um, join with our colleagues and friends and allies and really push for this very hard together. So um, I'm eager to hear your thoughts and your questions and um, thank you for uh, your time listening to me. And thank you uh, so much, uh, David Michaels. That was uh, just a fabulous tour through the work that you've done. And I really, really appreciate your call for action. I think that we have some interesting questions that have been appearing um, in the chat box and I'm gonna try to give them um, justice. And, and actually, I'm gonna start with a question that I have though. And I've been thinking a lot about um, the last year or so. And in particular, some of the uh, very negative um, attacks that have occurred you know, on public health, on public health workers. And I mean, here we have not a chemical uh, the kind of thing that you and I have worked on as, a, as regulators. Uh, nobody intentionally makes the coronavirus. There's no financial interest behind the coronavirus, right? But yet we have seen a, a lot of negativity about um, um, uh, the rules around um, both, you know, staying at home, masks and other restrictions. And I'm guessing, you know, because of other kinds of economic um, activities that have been negatively impacted um, by those things, I'm guessing that's what's behind some of that. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. The only precedent in, in my lifetime has been some, you know, back many years when smoking bans were first being imposed in public places, some of my colleagues who were working in state and local public health agencies actually lost their jobs over doing smoking bans because of the restaurant and bar industries being upset, um, saying that this was um, an invasion of personal freedom. Some of the same things that I've heard um, in the current context about objections to masking and even objections to, to receiving the vaccination. And I'm just wondering what your thought is about that and, and and what kind of um, constituencies can we build around strengthening public health in the face of that kind of opposition? Yeah, uh, look, you've raised a very, very important but very tough question. And we're, we're starting after a year and a half of, of a really miserable discussion and you know, ideological push around these issues. So it's gonna be hard to catch up. When I look back on the last you know, year and a half or so, one of the big regrets is um, the failure of public health, and the, not that we could have done things very differently, but certainly putting out the message that the reason you were doing these things, and the reason we're asking you to take these steps, the reason we're asking you to, take, to wear a mask is not for you. 
it's for it's for everybody together. It's for your family. It's for you know and and personalize it. Make it very real about the people who are, who you could be infecting unknowingly, and not to blame you, but to say we're this really is one which we are all in together. There's no better example of this. It's not like pollution where someone is putting out pollution and you're affected. This is we could all be the the vector of this disease. And so this idea that I don't care if I get sick is not, you know, you know that makes no sense if we had explained it right. And we didn't. Um, and it's gonna be very tough to change that now, but that's certainly one thing, you know, we, we need to pull together that community. Um, you know, I don't know the best way to do that. And certainly there are experts in, in, in um, you know, the, who are communications experts and sociologists who, who can help us think about messaging that. But I think this it's been a, a huge um, failure of our public health infrastructure not making that point. And you know, it obviously came from the top and that wasn't gonna come during the Trump administration, but that's, that's the message that we all need to, to, um, to, to be talking about. Um, I think this, the, you know, there, it does have a long history, obviously. Look, we have, you know, the, the helmet law suck movement. I mean, the people didn't want to, <laughs> um, you know, seat belts. I mean, you know, we go through this all the time. Um, but in many cases, we find that, you know, once you put them, these things into place and you have some carrots and you have some sticks, they usually are, for, you know, some of the, the objections um, are forgotten. And we really need to figure out how to do that. What's surprising to me now, right around, you know, right now there are all sorts of issues around getting people vaccinated, convincing them. And, and you know, there are a lot of studies being done out there looking at what are people's attitudes toward vaccination. But what we're not doing, we should be doing not necessarily randomized, but trials. You know, one of the, the weaknesses of our public health system is this 50 state plus, you know, DC and territory model. Um, on the other hand, the fact that we have all these different systems, I would think the federal government should start funding different types of interventions in different places and let's figure out if they work. And just, I mean, there's no shortage of money to pour into this because the, the costs of this, this pandemic are so high, but we're not doing that. Yeah, I know it's true in, in, in our school and other schools of public health, we have people who do such trials, but you don't really see much of that coming uh, from the federal government. You're absolutely right about that, um, um, David. I, similarly tough question now um, from one of our participants, and I know you've worked long and hard on this issue, and that is um, the ability, the willingness of OSHA to um, issue safety rules about uh, protection um, of people from COVID, and in particular, the, the um, hospital workers. And so I think, I think you're asked to comment about the recently issued um, safety rule on hospitals but I, I think we'd, we'd probably enjoy hearing a, a broader comment from you about the issue in general of, of the healthcare system and, and the protection of the workers and why it, it just took so long um, if, if, for OSHA to respond. Well, there are two different, there are a bunch of different questions within that question. You know, OSHA finally issued an emergency temporary standard for healthcare workers. It's a very weak standard. Um, one of the very first things I learned when I worked, went to the uh, energy department in 1999, by the way, I was chosen because I chaired the committee that you appointed me to. Oh. And they, uh, I was able to do enough useful things that they chose me to, to replace Tara O'Toole, who many of you may know as Assistant Secretary for um, Environment, Safety and Health. But um, at the time there were, uh, we had quite a few people in the nuclear weapons complex with beryllium disease. And they weren't being compensated. They were suing the government. They were losing. It was it was really a terrible situation. So um, I worked out the whole policy with um, Secretary Bill Richardson, and I we were making a proposal to the White House. And I went, was in a meeting with OMB, and this was early in my first job at, in uh, the government. I said the Energy Department's policy is X, and the uh, Deputy Director of OMB said at the time, the Energy Department has no policy the administration has a policy. And so OSHA standards are not really, they don't really come out of OSHA. They have to go through an interagency process. And the CDC has a great deal of say into what OSHA can do and not do in 
the world of hospitals and healthcare. And the CDC has been remarkably intransigent around this question of how uh, airborne infections spread. And this is not around COVID. This actually, my first exposure to this, if you use that word, was uh, during the H1N1 pandemic when OSHA wanted uh, better controls in hospitals. And the CDC said, no, it is uh, influenza is only spread by droplets and uh, surgical masks are adequate. And we said at the time, and this was um, in, 19, in 2009, 2010, um, no, there's plenty of evidence that this is spread through small aerosol uh, particles. And the CDC and some of the infectious disease sort of um, uh, leadership around the country has clung to this idea, even though at this point, outside of those few people, there really is no um, agreement with that at all anymore. I mean, there's, and some really, um, uh, the, some of the leaders of, of that movement have actually switched over. Dr. Klumpus from um, Partners, uh, who was a firm believer a year ago in the droplet theory, has just published this, several articles where uh, he, by sequencing virus uh, in different patients and workers at the Brigham Hospital showed very clearly that exposures are occurring over great distances. But um, CDC maintains that uh, this is not the case. And, and I think that means it's, it's much harder to protect healthcare workers from COVID. But even putting aside COVID, you know, I used to go out and I would give a talk to uh, large groups and I'd say, um, tell me, what do you think, what are the... Uh, types of workers, what are the job titles with the highest injury rates? And people would often say, you know, logging um, or agriculture, which are true, they're, they're up there. Um, when I, and they'd say construction and mining, and I'd say, well, you missed a big one, healthcare. Health, the, the injury rate of healthcare workers is far higher than manufacturing or coal mining or construction. It's up there with, you know, logging and, you know, some of the, the most hazardous uh, jobs, it, it's it's because it's women. Um, they're not tr traumatic injuries. People aren't losing their hands, but they're destroying their backs and they often can't work. And it's really very, um, very dangerous work. But it's very, it's difficult to get hospital administrators and physicians to recognize this, uh, where it's easier to get the CEO of a, a manufacturing company to recognize they have an injury problem than to get the CEO of a hospital to recognize that. So David, I have an idea for another book, <laughs> and that is how industry and trade associations are so adept at using the interagency review process and employing the effort of agencies like CDC, in your case, in my case, it was sometimes the Department of Agriculture, Energy, other agencies to block regulation on behalf of these industries. And unfortunately, um, mostly, you know, a public health um, organizations, um, not-for-profits have no idea how to get in and use those, those, those levers. Um, they're very powerful. And, um, and it's just another way um, that things get, I think, uh, derailed, or as you said, you know, uh, delayed, um, delayed. And, and the cost of delay, I think, with, the, with these hospital rules has been pretty um, shocking. You, you, you didn't address that, but I mean, there, there's been a very real price that's been paid in terms of not only illness and death among these workers uh, during COVID, but also how many people have decided that they could no longer do that work. I, I think we've seen an outmigration in some real health shortage areas that are quite critical that will have an impact on health and healthcare over time uh, because of how some of these workers were treated. Um, anyway. Um, a similar question, although a slightly different tack. Um, so, and I'm going to slightly reword it from Dr. Schwartz. And, and that is that the skepticism towards science and public health seems to be selective, I think is, is what he's saying. That it, it, some, some science that is used to support um, regulation, um, like um, the ozone layer, um, the, the impacts of chlorofluorocarbons, I guess, on the ozone layer um, are, are less... Um, less controversial than other areas of science, like for example, the impacts of um, emissions on um, climate change. On, um, and um, 
or the science around COVID-19. He also said the science around H1N1, but I, I would also say, I think you illustrated that that is controversial when it comes to the respiratory protection um, issues, but. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. The One of the reasons things become controversial is if you have um, a party who wants to make it controversial. We think there's very little debate over uh, chlorofluorocarbons now. And we, re we accept that it caused a, causes a hole in the ozone, et cetera. But in fact, when the, the original work was done by Mario Molina and Sherry Rowland, um, it was controversial. And they got a Nobel Prize less than 10 years later. So it changed fast. But um, uh, when I was in the energy department, I saw a memo written by Hill and Knowlton Bill Knowlton was, you know, the go-to firm for the tobacco industry on, on their manufacturing uncertainty. And they, they were trying to sell their services to the beryllium industry. And so they include all these case studies of the work they had done. And they described how they worked for DuPont to delay acceptance of the CFC hypothesis for enough time for C DuPont to develop an alternative product so they wouldn't lose market share. But once they got that, they said, oh, okay. We're fine. Now, at the beginning of this pandemic, I used to joke that, well, fortunately, COVID-19 doesn't have a lobbyist. But it turns out they didn't really need to have one because the, the ideological drivers right now, um, you know, have raised all these issues about science as well. But I think anything that has this sort of um, very important economic or political impact uh, ends up being controversial. And that's, that's really unfortunate. So David, you've worked a lot on the, on the federal level uh, but there is also a question about what um, local public health um, departments and agencies can do um, in terms of environmental and occupational health disparities in their communities. Um, is there much? Is there much that they can do? When I it think, comes yes, I think there's a huge amount they can do. And well, first, the biggest problem, of course, is they're totally underfunded, and um, they're often funded through you know, local tech, the local tax base, or they get some money through CDC or some of these other agreements. But there are, I don't think there are local health departments that are not underfunded. So taking on new projects is difficult right now to talk about, but they should be much better funded. And if they were, then we could think about what they could do. And in fact, before the sort of the, um, the regulatory revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, they played a much bigger role, but they, they pulled back. You know, it used to be local health departments got involved in workplace safety issues, but, but they stopped doing that because OSHA came around. You know, they, OSHA, and the same is true on EPA, where there's a, there are state functions and federal functions, but there's no reason why local public health departments couldn't play a much more important role in, in defending the, the health of their citizens. And there are creative ways to do that. Um, we've seen that when local health departments uh, go up against economic powers, it could be very difficult for them. And certainly that's come up around COVID, around when uh, local health departments have tried to report cases coming out of meatpacking plants and um, they've been silenced. It's certainly problematic, but it's, we should, it's something that it's very important to encourage. I mean, the federal government is not on the ground in those places. You know, the EPA doesn't have people in every location. You know, OSHA has, you know, in many um, states, the, the closest OSHA inspector is a full day's drive from, any, from certain workplaces. So you can't expect them to do very much often, but local health departments should have a great deal more power and they should be in and out of workplaces. They should be looking at, at water pollution sources um, and working in conjunction. We need a public health system that really is a system not just leaving it to the federal government to do some of these things. Yeah, well, your point about the water pollution is a good one. Uh, the, uh, it's always been, I think, problematic that we have uh, some regulatory um, agencies that look at what's in the water and then someone else is looking at what's in the air and then someone else is looking at what's in the facility that the workers are, are, are working on. And if you don't put those things together, you're not going to get a good picture of how public health is impacted by that activity. And, and there is a little bit of a, of a pushing these pollutants from one place to another, um, it's, it, which has been a problem. Um, but okay, so another completely different question and um, workplace uh, violence. And I guess I would start with, um, you know, is this an important issue? 
Um, I mean, we keep hearing now about violence um, on airplanes. We keep hearing about mass shooting incidents in workplaces. Um, how important is this issue? And is this an issue that, um, that OSHA can, um, can, can deal with? I mean, I know when I was at EPA, I wasn't allowed to get anywhere close to firearms because the TSCA legislation specifically um, said that, you know, you can regulate the chemicals except if they're in, in bullets, they're fine, you know, right? <laughs> Lead is bad unless it's in a bullet, in which case, you know, we couldn't touch it. But um, what um, what do you think about that issue, David? Well, um, it, actually, I, see, it's a, I have a similar sort of funny story in that the when I was confirmed to, by the Senate for the OSHA job, the one thing I had to promise was not to regulate guns in the workplace because theoretically OSHA could, and that would have essentially stopped my uh, confirmation. It wasn't it wasn't difficult for me to say I will not regulate guns in the workplace because I think that would probably destroy OSHA as well if we tried to do that. But um, workplace violence is a really important issue, especially in healthcare. In fact, we had meetings with representatives of hospital workers and hospital workers themselves all through the time I was at OSHA. And I would often ask about ergonomic problems because I always saw those as being issues. And by the by late in my term there, by 2015, I would hear from hospital workers, you know, the hospitals are starting to address those issues, but the thing we care most about is violence. The fear of violence impacts our work every day. If you're working in an emergency room, you're afraid of being assaulted. Um, people come in, they're angry or they're looking for drugs. There are patients who ought to be in um, the psychiatric ward and they're not, they're violent as well. Mm -hmm. and so the last thing I did when I was at OSHA in January 2017 was to accept a petition from nurses unions and a number of other groups uh, to start the regulatory process to issue a standard for protecting healthcare workers because just like uh, other hazards there are things hospitals can do to protect healthcare workers they could say for example that in certain situations a worker can't be alone there have to be two of them if you're facing a, a person who has a, a psychiatric history for example or you have to have two doors in the room so the um, the endangered worker can escape or an emergency button, things like that. It, it should be done. The number of workplace injuries associated with assaults is gigantic. But it's interesting, the question is, is this an OSHA issue? When OSHA began, no one thought of it as an issue. And the early 1990s, uh, staff from the Women's Bureau, which is a historic branch of the Labor Department that's advocated for women and families really since the 1930s, um, came to OSHA and said, you know, you should really take on workplace violence as an issue. And I, I'm, I'm just told, so I wasn't there. The OSHA staff and leadership and the attorneys looked at each other and said, well, that's really interesting. And they reviewed it and they said, yeah, you know, absolutely, just no one, no one raised this. And it's become an important issue to OSHA. And on that same level, it's not unreasonable to think that as things develop, OSHA should think about bullying and other things that make workplaces crummy in that they're hazards and they make, if they cause people to be hurt. But certainly workplace violence, especially in healthcare settings, should be a very high priority and certainly was when I was there. I mean, I think arguably some of the research has shown, at least in healthcare settings, that bullying contributes to unsafe environments. Uh, when it's the case that the bully is somebody who will not um, allow feedback about unsafe conditions or unsafe behaviors. And um, it's kind of dangerous. Um, it's a dangerous behavior pattern that unfortunately is present in all too many workplaces, I'm sure. Um, David, um, <laughs> we also have a question about you know specifically the occupational health and safety of, of BIPOC um, folks. And there's a lot of interest now, uh, obviously, in, in structural racism. You showed data that were pretty compelling about the racial disparities in COVID um, uh, morbidity and mortality. But what about in, in, in the workplace? What is, what is that condition um, like now? And in particular, um, how can people who are dedicated to equity in occupational healthy health and safety organize um, to involve um, people from marginalized communities uh, to develop more expertise to get more engaged? This is a, 
you know, this has been a historic issue in the United States. I mean, look at, you know, the, the worst jobs in the country for many years, of course, were slaves. People were enslaved. And whether they were injured um, really was of, of minor interest to their slaveholders and they could be replaced. They, 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 they were dealt with as property. The injury rates for immigrant workers all through the Industrial Revolution, um, people willing to take jobs that others would not take, the people who'd been here, are you know were astounding. And, um, I actually wrote my first paper on this in 1989. Um, it was very clear that occupational cancer was a problem much more on, among black workers than white workers. In fact, if you looked at the steel mill, for example, the steel mills, the worst place to work was on the top of the coke ovens where you had the lung cancer risk several times uh, higher than people working elsewhere. And of course, those were all black workers. It continues today, and the places I see this most are in these sort of the jobs that are not as closely connected to the traditional employer. The um, workers who line up outside the Home Depot uh, to get the job for one day, and if, you know, if they're injured on the job, if they're lucky, their employer will put them in the back of the station wagon and drop them off at the emergency room. Often they won't even know who that person was. You know, the, the temp worker and uh, BIPOC People are much more likely to be temp workers. Temp workers are at greatly increased risk of, of injury and, and death um, because they're starting a new job and they don't know what's going on at the workplace. They haven't been trained. Um, and of course, many employers know that if they hire uh, unauthorized workers and they're injured, they won't apply for workers' comp. Or if they do, they call it immigration. There's been scandals about that in Florida where there's one construction company that regularly does that. <laughs> That's their policy. Um, so I think, first of all, organizing around immigration is a really important issue because if people have rights to be here and can raise their voice, that will make them safer. The other thing is the worker center movement has been very important. Uh, these are gathering up workers and talking to them about their rights and helping them organize. Um, in Texas, uh, the Workers Defense Project is now in many of the cities in Texas and they, they help organize workers and to, uh, to get local ordinances passed that said, for example, in the intense heat of the summer, you have to give people breaks for heat. And that, that couldn't be done talking to individual employers. It had to be done through, um, through legislation. Unfortunately, it's my understanding the Texas state legislature either has or is trying to overturn that saying local ordinances, you can't local, governments can't pass those ordinances. So it's always going to be a struggle. But these issues around the workers who are less connected to their tradition, the traditional employers um, through worker centers, you know, temp workers and, and day laborers and stuff, these are the people at greatest risk um, because of their color, because of their status. And they're the ones we have to work with um, to protect. And of course, this is again, one of these issues um, they're really like Heather McGee raises in, in The Sum of Us, which is that protecting these workers isn't just the right thing to do for these workers. But as long as a home builder can hire an unauthorized worker who, and never have to pay con a worker's compensation if they fall from the roof, why should they hire a, a, a citizen worker who might join a union and demand more pay? So that the fact that they can do that hurts every worker in the United States. It reduces their safety and means they make lower wages. Absolutely, David. Um, so I mean, I'm gonna really take a dramatic shift here because several of the questions are about your views around some of the, the science and analytics that go into the actual regulatory um, process. So we're going now from hyper-local to hyper-federal. <laughs> and some of the topics that um, have been raised are, you know, one, of course, uh, the requirements uh, which um, have you know come forth year after year from the Office of Management and Budget around assessing costs and benefits and cost benefit type analyses. Um, related to that, I think the use of epidemiology and how um, um, you know the fact that uh, perhaps we don't teach very well how to use epidemiology and regulation. I happen to think it's not that there are other barriers. Um, that, that get erected in terms of its use. And then um, also the, the potential for being able to um, use uh, behavioral economics as opposed to you know, costs and benefits, you know, really take into, um, into consideration what people prefer as opposed to our 
our estimates of what we think things actually cost. So kind of that's a, that's a pretty wide open um, field, but, but what do you think, you know, from what you've seen in terms of how these analyses are done, um, what would you do if you could, you know, rewrite the executive order for OMB about, you know, what kind of science should underpin regulations? Well, I mean, there are a number of different uh, components of that. And so I mentioned, which I go into much very detail in my book, this idea of, of addressing chemicals as classes rather than individuals and thinking about what we call in occupational control banding, putting lots of chemicals in one category and saying, this is the way you protect people. Even if you don't have complete evidentiary base for every one of those chemicals. Um, epidemiology has its limits. And while epidemiology is really important, and obviously it's something I, I love, you know, changed my life when I read Mervyn Susser's book, Causal Thinking in the Health Science, I said, I want to be an epidemiologist. But if we say we're, you need epidemiology to regulate these exposures, um, you're, you're not going to get there. I mean, epidemiology is really important and we should be look, doing epidemiology to identify problems, but we, we can't use it just by itself. But this idea of, of thinking about how people, um, how behave, the learnings of behavioral science and how they can be impactful, I think is really fascinating and important. Um, one thing I've been watching really carefully is um, this question of this, this practice in many cities of having the local health department put a letter grade of the the cleanliness of the kitchen of a restaurant in the window. And you know, it's been very effective. It's, it's in, there was a study in Los Angeles that said um, the first year that they did this, there were lots of B's and C's. And uh, the A's, the restaurants with A's economically, financially did much better. And the C's did worse. And of course, right, if you walk by a restaurant with a C, are you gonna go in there? Some people will, but some won't. So that was a lot of incentive for the restaurants with letter C to clean up without the government having to go in there and say, okay, what are you doing here? And the second year and the third year, there were far fewer C's and there were more A's and food related or foodborne pathogens causing hospitalization went down. There was fewer hospitalizations for food poisoning. So that sort of thing I think is very effective to get information out to people. So one of the regulations that I came up with and we actually um, issued was to make workplace injury rates public that employers would have to actually, employers have always, not always, but for decades, kept an OSHA log with injuries and illnesses. And the illnesses I never thought were accurate, but oh, the injuries to some extent are accurate, but they were always just held by the employer. So we issued a, um, a, a regulation saying that employers of a certain size, not the really small ones and not low hazard industries, actually had to annually send their, just the summary data, how many injuries, and, you know, how many hours did people work to come up with a rate to OSHA? And that came out just before um, the Trump administration, well, it came out actually in 2015, but when the Trump administration um, took power, they sort of stopped that from moving forward in that they actually agreed to keep collecting the data, but they wouldn't let be public. My objective was to say, this should be public because you know there are plenty of examples where, for example, what I used to love was we had data from nursing homes. So there was two nursing homes in um, Statesboro, North Carolina, three miles apart. And one of them had a, an injury rate of four per 100,000 and the other had an injury rate of like you know 25 or something. If you're looking for a job, which one do you want to work for? Right, I mean, you want to go and just getting that information out will have a big impact. And so the um, OSHA finally got together to collect that data um, and they were sued by Public Citizen and by um, Reveal, the uh, Center for Investigative Reporting. And the, both, in both cases, OSHA lost because we had written this regulation very clearly to make this public. And it is public now. And actually, a lot of the articles you're reading now about Amazon injury rates are because OSHA had to release the data about the injury rate uh, at every Amazon fulfillment center. So having inf public, making information public about exposures, about injuries, things like that, I think can have a very positive public health impact. Uh, you're, you're mute. Thank you. Yeah, that is, you're right. It's very powerful. And I'm, I'm reminded um, by one of the um, 
questions um, in the chat box. Um, um, David, um, you worked um, to develop um, the COVID-19 National Health Worker Survey, which wound up being a project that was largely carried forth by a number of our students and, and others at GW. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the experience of trying to do research, you know, in the midst of a pandemic. I, I mean, to study it while it's happening, um, but also, and, and as just pointed out, it's um, um, Brenda Trejo, one of our doctoral students who wrote this comment, that you found that workers called for employers to treat them with respect and wanted more labor rights, time off, mental health care, and zero tolerance for bullying or retaliation. And how, you know, even in the face of a pandemic that you could um, increase the stress or decrease the stress by how you're actually treating um, your workers. But what was it like, I mean, putting that together in the middle of um, uh, basically the storm? Well, that was, I mean, I'm very glad you raised it and, and I'm glad uh, Brenda Trejo, who is really a co-principal investigator on this, um, you know, raised it in the in the chat room. It's a really, I think, a very useful survey. You know, on one level, on a personal level, for me, who you know, I'm I'm in a comfortable home. I'm able to work at home. It's very easy. But reaching out to these workers and, and getting information from them, I think, was challenging and was really rewarding in the the response we got from workers who who talked about these issues. We put together an anonymous survey. We um, we didn't collect an information that would be identifiable in any way because people are very concerned. And so we put this together in a way that people didn't give us enough information that anyone could identify them. But we heard these same pleas saying, you know, we don't, we're not respected, here we are. And a lot of this was collected early in the pandemic when people were, it was a very stressful time and people were not given adequate PPE and they were, had to reuse their N95s, things like that. Um, it was just, it was very, uh, uh, powerful to read these descriptions and it shows that you know while worker safety can focus on sort of these very um, technical issues like you know what's the right sort of mask we also have to look at these power relationships um, and that's really in some ways that's the theme which you know Brenda and her colleagues really wrote about that um, that has a, a huge impact on people's lives and and you know we, don't just, we shouldn't just be looking at the virus and the ventilation system and the masks, but also what's the relationship with people there and what's going on with their jobs and their lives. Thank you so much for that, David. And thank you so much um, for a very powerful presentation and a wonderful um, um, Q&A session. I've got to thank Patrick Sanders uh, for helping to staff this and making sure that uh, the questions were conveyed to us and especially, of course, Richard Southby and Janet Southby for their sponsorship of this annual, um, this annual um, presentation. It's been suggested that this was so successful, we should use Zoom um, every year um, for this. And I, I think that's possibly the case, but thank you uh, so much, Dr. Michaels. It's such an honor to have you on our faculty and it was wonderful to have you uh, join us uh, for this year's annual Southby lecture. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you. everybody. Thank you for this invitation and thank you, Dr. Southby for making this all happen. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Lynn and Patrick.